Finally, I think we're going to just go straight to it and we'll do the, the networking break part after. Hopefully everyone's okay on bathrooms. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to welcome uh, Mark Jamison, Arthur, author, sorry, Arthur, author, trainer, and coach. Um, he helps companies, as they speed up, slow down. He created his own approach called Calm. Um, and he had this in his bio. Why do smart people do dumb things? One of the questions he's trying to figure out in his life, so I thought I would also put that up there. Um, so Mark? Yeah, so press oh. right and then smile. Oh. Uh, success has many fathers, failures, and orphan. Um, August the 31st, 1997. Uh, who can remember what they were doing on that day? Day. On that day. It was, uh, what day of the week? Sunday. Sunday. Yep. I know it's Sunday because I'm at work. <laughs> And I've been working every Sunday for the past 13 weeks. And I'm in my 30s, and uh, I am riding this wave of success and taking over challenges. And all of a sudden, I'm dealing with a challenge that I didn't know whether I could cope with it or not. And uh, you might remember that day, because that picture there is of uh, the car crash in Paris when Lady Diana was killed. And uh, it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon in New Zealand. Uh, I'm in my 30s, I've got two young children, I've got a mortgage, uh, I'm working for IBM and I'm a project manager and I'm sort of in this spot where everything so far had been going really, really well for me. Um, but I'm dealing with something that was in great big trouble and I'm running a team of 83 people, so I know it's not the Channel Tunnel but try managing 83 people when everything's going wrong. And I'm the third project manager who's been brought into this particular situation. Um, your first project manager, typically that's the salesperson, and so you know everyone's telling this really good story about how they want things to happen, and someone's sort of, it's pretty salesy, and you're sure something's gonna happen. Then you get in somebody who knows what they're doing, and we discover that the gap between what everyone was promised and what everyone thought would happen is quite a big gap. And so this person generally tries to bridge it, and it's pretty hard, and generally they get their marching orders as well. And then you have the third project manager, who's the person who actually saves the whole situation and brings it into fruition. So we're working away, trying to make something work. Now, in 1997, we had the internet. Might surprise you. <laughs> That's why um, that Lady Diana death was one of the first events that actually uh, caused news, agents to, uh, news sources to start running news feeds on the internet. And it's actually the first big story that broke on BBC. And it's about Lady Day of the Die. And I'm sitting there, and it's Sunday, and uh, you know, I should be with my wife and my two young children because that's important. But you know what? I'm so stressed, they really didn't care that I was there or not. In fact, the best thing they said is you should be in work. And I'm going work on a Sunday because like every other day of the week, because things are in trouble, you might have been in this place yourself. Um, everybody wants a status report and a plan. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what happens is you report on the Monday, then you get all this stuff on the Tuesday and the Wednesday, and then you spend Thursday and Friday spinning it, so that by the time you get to Monday again, you've got half a reasonable story. Um, so the only time you get any work done is a Sunday, because the other thing that happens is, um, if you're used to this sort of thing, and you've ever tried to run a big team of people, everyone is coming in your door all the time, and you're trying to be this cool manager, and, you know, which is giving time for everybody and helping everybody, but I'll tell you, it's exhausting. And privately, what's happening to me is that I am so, so stressed. I'm just thinking, I don't know if I can actually cope with that. Sometimes I think, I'm just going to burst. And I remember problems would come up on a Sunday. And what I would do is I'd go outside and walk in the evening. And I'd walk around the block 10 times, just trying to get myself into some semblance of normality. Tough stuff. But here's the thing, we got the system live. We had to take the system that was failing, it had to meet a particular date, we had to meet that date because it's a new commercial product, we wanted to beat the market, first internet bank in Australasia. Um, we had to make it launch on a certain day, because that's when we'd booked the advertising and the marketing people were in control, everyone being there, marketing, that's alright. <laughs> 
Um, we launched this. We have all these issues. We've got an issue list of 297. We work our way through this, but we made it. We made it. It was my triumph, and it was the team's triumph. It was absolutely fantastic. My crown and glory. I was the absolute, absolute hero. Fantastic. Except. <laughs> Except. After we'd been live for two months, the customer threw the entire system out because it never worked to their satisfaction. So all of that effort, everything that we've done, actually turned out, in terms of the result, to be a great fat zero. And the way the world goes, that when everything is successful, there's all these people who have contributed to it. If you've ever been in project management, it's a bit like being an entrepreneur, except there's no upside. <laughs> Seriously, that's why I'm now an entrepreneur. Um, you realise that you're the person who uh, takes all the glory and you're the person who takes all the blame. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, this is not good. I'll tell you how bad it is, right? We had spent $17 million building this system and we didn't get paid any of it. Yep. And it didn't work and, of course, we lost one of the biggest customers in the country. And I'm sitting there, and I did sit there. I actually uh, went for a little drive into the hills, and I went and sat down, and uh, I'm from Auckland. This is a beautiful spot. I remember it still. I'm sitting there, and I'm looking out over the city, and I'm thinking, what has happened? What can I do? Because by every objective measure, and results is what we get measured by, this is a disaster. This is a small town. I've failed publicly, and I'm the guy who lost $17 million. Now, I don't know if you've been in a tough spot. Now, for me, um, I felt I had let the team down. I felt that I'd sold them some some falsehood, that we'd all worked so well to actually make this work, and then in the end, all of their hard work came to nothing. Uh, I felt like I had motivated them and jeeped them along for something that if I'd known this was going to happen, it's almost like I wish I'd known what was going to go wrong because I'd never have taken them through this. So I'm feeling pretty bad. My professional reputation, no matter how you look at this, is in great danger because New Zealand's a small town. By the way, this is 1997, and this is not the reason why I'm in Singapore now. I only came here three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but here's a funny thing, and I think you might have experienced it yourself. It was odd that I ought to feel really terrible, but at that time, something else happened, and, and I find it difficult to explain. But from somewhere, something inside somehow came to the fore. And this is something, and I can't describe it, but I knew at that time that I would be all right. And it's difficult to describe, but it's something that that feeling and that impression of being in a very tough place actually saw me through. So what have we got to do? We have to do damage limitation. Yeah? Absolutely. Now, here's the really strange thing about this whole situation. After it, I got promoted. <laughs> yeah. I became the expert on project failure because the one thing <laughs> that drives you, isn't it, when we actually something doesn't work, we really, really want to know why it happened because we never want to go through that again. So I studied it and I learned quite a few interesting things. And I think the one really interesting thing and in the IT market Failure is the norm. <laughs> yeah? People have been studying project failure for so, so long. <laughs> yeah? And uh, this is some nice small figures that I don't expect you to read. Um, but basically, you have still a, let's get this right, 74% of chance of fucking up on any IT project. Yeah? It will either fail 
Yep, or it will be so challenged, and the average that these challenge projects uh, go over is, um, I think they go over time by 180% and, and money by 160%. Um, these failed investments, we're wasting money and money and money and money. So here's the first thing. If you're in IT, you're going to have some pretty tough times, so you better learn how to deal with it. Absolutely. Here's the other really interesting thing. Um, so I got promoted. Um, I started getting a reputation for turning around trouble projects. That was my reward because I knew an awful lot about it. The last project that I worked on, $50 million initial estimate, $250 million it cost to deliver, the customer was happy. <laughs> yeah? This world is not what they teach you in business school, right? This sort of stuff goes on all the time, and companies are really, really smart at covering these things over. So if you want to survive, you want to start being a bit smart and realise the situation that you're in. Now, this talk would not be complete unless I actually quoted a dead white male. <laughs> so, <laughs> Leo Tolstoy, is that dead and white enough for you? Um, when I started looking at why things, why we fuck up all the time, because it's a, actually it's a, it's a way of life, um, what he says is this, happy families are all alike. Yeah? When things are going great, everything's going great. Yeah? I mean... There's no sense looking at it. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Yeah? So when things start going wrong, you can look at all these multitude things of what's wrong. There's tons and tons of things that are wrong. So when you start to study this and say, why do things go wrong? Because this, this is, my, um, by the way, my, um, my key subject. Um, we discover that the reason why things go wrong is that people keep on doing really dumb things all the time. And they do dumb things that are to do with people and not with technology. Yeah? It's about people. Yeah? They don't talk to each other. <laughs> Politics, egos, disputes about competencies. You've all been there, right? Everybody's sitting around and they're all arguing about is this a good person, is that a bad person? Nobody's actually focusing on the job. Um, insufficient project planning. Well, you know, it's important. But tell me, what sort of person, if they're running a major project, doesn't actually plan it all right? I mean, you know, dumb, dumb. And so I became my lifelong study, not only of project failure, but why do people do dumb things? Now, first we start with ourselves. Come on, we all know we've done really dumb stuff. <laughs> and we've had lots of people talk up, and we keep on doing it. So I started myself, and then I started looking at other people. So, I discovered a few things. One is that the, what they don't teach you in business school and publish in the press is that failure is a way of life. Yeah? Any business event, any... Tell me anybody's had a perfect life. Yeah? Perfect relationships, perfect children, they've all grown up fine, your job's been fine, your career's been fine. You've, it just doesn't work. This is life, right? So we can try and aim for success, but we actually have to acknowledge that, you know, life's tough. And so here's the rule. Don't make it any harder than necessary. Yeah? And ourselves, right? What happens? We do dumb stuff. That's okay. You don't need to make it any harder than necessary on yourself. It's a fact of life. Um, one of my key mentors uh, told me, look, here's the trick. Life is a contact sport. <laughs> yeah? Like rugby. I'm from New Zealand. It's a contact sport. There's no way you can avoid it. You can't withdraw from it. Here's the thing that saved me and hopefully will save you. This whole thing is only personal when you make it personal. Yeah? If you make it all about you, then you're standing up, your ego is out there for display, and you're going to come a cropper. And this is my big lesson that I'm pleased I learned in 1997 in a painful way. Yeah? If it's about you, boy, are you going to be in trouble. Absolutely. <coughs> if it's about ideas and doing great stuff and great concepts, everybody looks at that and they look past you. Um, I, I got hired again by IBM six years ago, right? This same organisation, which I lost all this money. Because... It's the way that you are, yeah? It's not actually what you do. You're always going to have problems. People remember the way that you deal with them, not that they were. Um, here's my favourite. Smart people can do dumb things when you give them the right conditions. Anyone. I'm sitting... This was not my own failure, right? I'm sitting there with two CEOs from leading organisations and a vice president from the US and the head of the bank from Australia. We're all in this together, Yeah? <laughs> doing really dumb stuff. That's one reason why we don't talk too much about it. <laughs> ah, 
but it's in my book, so it's all right. It's out in the open. You can make smart people do really dumb things. What you need to do is get them really stressed. Yeah? That's all you have to do. You just have to wind them up <laughs> and get them really busy. If you do that, that's assured, right? Our, our beautiful horizon, our big picture just goes down and down and down and we start working away, working away, and we miss the entire picture. Our relationships suffer. It's all bad. And here's my favourite. Um, because I am not Tony Robbins at all. I am the anti-Tony Robbins. Seriously. Passion is not enough. The world is full of passionate people. The world is full of really, really bad advice. Yeah? <laughs> If it was only just took passion, we'd all be wonderfully successful. Yeah? It would all be great. But it takes a lot more than passion. You've got to get everything right. It takes passion and it takes motivation and you've got to be smart. Yeah? What people are really buying from you is the fact that you're smart and you're keeping your head and you're calm. So here's the deal. Um, I've worked in corporate for a long time. My customers are still corporate. I love it. I love the big skyscrapers, I love the waterfalls, I love the pot plants. It's cool, that's where I live, that's okay, I like it, I still wear suits. Um, but I'm now an entrepreneur, yeah? So let's look about how this works for us and entrepreneurs. You know, um, here's some figures, they're easy, I think you'd believe them, right? <laughs> First time entrepreneurs, yeah? Only 18% work, right? This is a fact of life. So don't do dumb stuff, yeah? Mortgage your house, <laughs> ruin a relationship, work too hard. Hey, this is the world we're in. It's full of things that don't work. Don't do really dumb stuff. Now, here's the, here's the one that I love. Don't give up your day job if you've got a wife and a family. <laughs> Seriously, there's ways of following your passion, like I do, yeah, while still <laughs> keeping your day job. We all want to live a passionate life. I love talking about this. I don't do it full time, that's all right. I do it enough to follow my passion. And um, here's the thing, here's the thing. Failure made me, yeah? This terrible thing that happened to me when I was sitting there and I was thinking, what am I going to do? Something happened. Something happened inside. I discovered this thing that anybody who's been in a terrible place knows the thing that comes to their rescue. And I kept on looking at that thing, yeah? And I kept on looking why people did dumb things, and I kept on looking at how we do smart things, and I not only made a career about it, I'm an entrepreneur about it, and if you want to know more, it's all in my book. So, thank you. <laughs>
I have a question. Um, you mentioned that a lot of web projects, mobile app projects, are you know over delayed and yes. over budgeted. Uh, two questions for that: Is that uh, significant to a particular geography, like India designers, or U.S. or Singapore? Because when you watch the, the mm. movie Social Network, Zuckerberg seems to bust mm. out the Facebook, you know, yeah. all by himself. Yeah, I haven't seen the movie. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, when we look at success rates, there seems to be a couple of things. Um, I'm not an expert on this, um, but when I look at these people who we normally quote, like Steve Jobs, or Bill Gates, or Facebook, and who who of us wouldn't actually like to, in our carriage, <laughs> become so rich we don't know what to do with the money? It would be fantastic. Um, but they seem to be outliers, or it seemed to be that everything seemed to have to happen at the right time. So maybe they got lucky. Um, it's difficult for me to see any other reason. In terms of project failure, my other pet subject, um, there's not much difference across geographies. Um, there is a difference across size of project. Um, so if your project budget is more than $10 million, you are almost certainly going to fail. Yeah, the success rate is about 5%. Um, if your project is under $500,000, it's got about a 70% chance of Working, so you know one of those rules in the agile world is just make it small. You know, like like just things get really complicated. People are good and talented. We all do our best, <laughs> but once start, things start getting big, then it's just really hard to make it work. So it seems to be more. Um, there's no real pattern or geographical pattern to it. Um, and even um, pro, uh, putting a PMO in or project management expertise or all the rest of that, most of those factors are not to do with project management disciplines. They have to do about people and their decision making and not being clear about what they wanted or um, being political or <laughs> not giving... It's, it's human stuff seem to be the key factors, not the, not the practical techniques of project management. We have one final question. Uh, do you still work on Sunday? <laughs> no, I really, really don't. Uh, Sunday is my um, day of rest and rejuvenation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, fantastic. And please get married. Before we make our final shout out, I want to make sure it's all sinking in. So, could everyone please turn in their seat to the right? Turn, everyone turn so you're.